Hey everybody, Joe from Home Crush here. In this video I'm going to compare all seven Meka T2.2 Cine lenses. This is going to be a big one, so you might want to hit the bathroom first. I'll wait. Okay, I know that a lot of people appreciate my videos being short and to the point. I'm going to try to make this video as short as possible, but there's so much to cover when comparing seven different lenses at once that this video will necessarily be a lot longer than usual. To help you out, I'm going to save the pontificating until the end. And as I hope this video can serve as a definitive guide, I'm including chapter markers for each section. That way you can jump right to the information you need when you need it. I'll start by comparing the physical characteristics of the lenses, build quality, size, weight, pro, and then I'll move to the charts to look at sharpness, distortion, brightness, contrast, and color. After that, we'll compare the focus distance, focus breathing, and bokeh. Then we'll look at the field of view, background compression, and portrait rendering with the help of a couple of models. Finally, I'll wrap up by comparing the makers to their closest alternatives and discuss which focal lengths you might want to start with and why. Sound good? Good. Oh, sorry, a few more things before we get started. Number one, I realize I kind of jumped the gun with this video as Meka is now going to release one more lens in the series, an 8mm. I could pretend that the 8mm doesn't belong in this matchup because it will actually be T2.9, not T2.2, but the truth is I just wasn't paying attention and didn't realize that the 8mm was coming. When the 8 arrives, I will definitely review it, but I will not be redoing this comparison. Sorry, this was a massive amount of work and I really want to focus on shooting some actual films, even with COVID-19 restrictions. Two, you're going to notice that you don't have to look at my ugly old mug during the comparisons. Big thanks to Alexis Taylor for coming out for what was surely the most boring job of her modeling career. And thanks to my son Zach, who in addition to assisting me, got roped into being the second model when the professional model flaked out and never showed up. Three, Meka has graciously agreed to give away a lens to one lucky viewer. YouTube doesn't allow me to tie contests to getting subscribers, so just leave a comment below for your chance to win. And hell, go ahead and subscribe. It won't affect your chances of winning, but it will warm my cold dark heart just a tiny bit to know that I'm not just shouting into the void. If you do subscribe, you'll be notified when I release part two of this video. Wait, what? There's more? Yeah, I'll tell you a bit more about it at the end of this video. All right, we're almost ready, but before we dive into the comparison, just a tiny bit of B-roll, because YouTube. When you're considering cinema lenses, their physical characteristics are what really set them apart from similarly, from simo, from similarly, similarly, from similarly, from similarly spec still lenses. In this regard, the Meka lenses don't disappoint. They handle like real cinema lenses, just smaller, which can be a huge advantage. Because these lenses are purpose designed for micro four third sensors, they can be smaller, lighter, and cheaper than lenses of equivalent quality designed for a larger sensor. And more compact lenses don't just mean cheaper lenses. They mean that your entire rig can be lighter, more compact, and less expensive than rigs of a similar quality designed to support larger gear. So as you can see, all seven of the Meka lenses are very close in length, and the focus and aperture gears line up fairly consistently. Note that the 35 is materially longer than the others, and the gears are placed differently enough that it could force you to move your follow focus. We'll talk about this more later, but the 35 really is kind of the odd man out in this set. All of the lenses use a 77 millimeter filter thread, and they all have a focus throw of about 270 degrees. This definitely simplifies matching accessories. The lenses vary in weight from a low of 490 grams for the 16 millimeter to a high of 660 grams for the 35 millimeter. Coupled with their similar lengths, this weight range is close enough to not necessitate rebalancing on most gimbals. All of the lenses feature an all metal build and subjectively, they feel like quality construction. Focus and aperture rings operate smoothly and are dampened to a satisfying amount of resistance. Almost all of the lenses focus past infinity which is really useful because distance from flange to sensor can vary from camera to camera. Annoyingly, the 85 millimeter stops at infinity. I have a few minor quibbles with how the lenses are marked. For every lens except the 25 millimeter, distance is marked in both metric and imperial measurements. 
and is only visible from one side of the lens. The 25mm only has imperial markings, but is visible from either side of the lens. The markings aren't phosphorescent on any of them, so they can't be seen in the dark, and they're not inscribed, so the markings may wear off over time under heavy handling. My last note on the physical characteristics of the lenses is that I wish they were sold with proper slip-on cinema lenses instead of the fiddly snap-in-place still lens caps that tend to pop off with handling and offer little to no protection. Though it is nice that the caps are marked. All seven of the Meka cinema lenses are usably sharp at T2.2 and are tack sharp by T4. Corner sharpness suffers some on the wider focal lengths but that's to be expected. Resolving power is definitely not a concern when matching these lenses. Consider this side-by-side -side comparison of the very softest situation, the 12mm at T2.2, against the very sharpest, the 85mm at T4. Barrel distortion is no more than 10% on even the widest of the Meka lenses, and essentially non-existent from 35mm and up. This amount of distortion is trivial to correct in post. Vignetting is also well managed on the Meka Cine lenses. Most of them hover around 10%. The 12 and 16 show the most noticeable vignetting, with a 13 and 14% difference from center to corner, respectively. This amount of vignetting is trivial to correct in post. Most of the Meka Cine lenses display some amount of purple fringing at T2.2 that virtually disappears by T4. The 65mm is the only lens to display red fringing.
Only the 25 suffers from noticeable fringing, even at T4. Here you can see how even the worst offender's fringing, the 25 at T2, can be mitigated in post. Using the 25 as our baseline, for reasons that will become obvious, how much do the other lenses deviate from it in terms of brightness, contrast, white balance, tint, and primary color rendition? The 25mm is the brightest of the lenses, with the 85mm 15% darker. As T-stops are supposed to be an absolute measure, this is disappointing. Luckily, even 15% is a small enough difference to correct in post. But if you set your exposure on an 85, and then switch to the 25, that 15% could mean the difference between blowing out bright highlights or not. So you need to keep an eye on your exposure tools when changing lenses. The 25 features the most contrast of the Meka lenses, with the 12 almost imperceptibly less so. Because of how prone it is to flare, my contrast measurements of the 35 are suspect, but it also serves as a warning that you need to be very careful to not wash out your image on the 35. The 25 sits in the middle of the white balance range, with the more telephoto lenses growing cooler and the wider lenses growing warmer. With an absolute maximum difference of only 200 degrees Kelvin, it's very easy to match in post, even if you don't shoot raw. Shifts in tint are a little more noticeable between the Meka lenses, with the 85 32% greener than the 12. Note that even those two extremes are not difficult to match in post. RGB primaries shift in hue very little from lens to lens. Such subtle differences are actually quite challenging to match in post because adjustments must be very small and very precise. Unless you are confident using curve tools, it's probably best to simply accept the small differences between these lenses. Now let's move on to some tests that showcase some of the more interesting visual differences between different focal lengths. Starting with the good old rack focus. Focus breathing is very well managed on all of the Meka lenses. While it's obviously easier to exploit a shallow depth of field with the more telephoto lenses, bokeh is similarly round and creamy across the entire range. No fussy ringing or distracting distortions. Minimum focus distance varies quite a bit, from as far away as 31 inches on the 85 to as crazy close as 3 inches on the 16. As I mentioned earlier, the more telephoto Meka lenses are quite prone to flare from bright light sources just off camera. This incidental glare is by far worse with the 35mm, but it is also something to watch out for on the 85 and 65. While the loss of contrast all but goes away with most lenses when you stop down to T4, interestingly, closing the aperture does little to control the issue on the 25.
Since the makas are modern designs with modern coatings, none of them offer particularly dramatic flares, even when you force them, with the 50 and the 35 perhaps featuring the most interesting starburst patterns. The most obvious and useful difference between the Mako lenses is, of course, their field of view. When we leave the camera stationary and only change lenses, the difference between 85 and 12mm is revealed to be quite stark. Personally, I don't see myself using either extreme very often for the type of work I do, but it's nice to know that if I need to shoot in a closet, I can make it look big, or if I need a close-up of an actor's nose hairs, I can get that from across the room. Note the changes to the subject and the background as we move the camera to keep the same subject framing. Technically, different focal lengths don't actually compress the difference between subject and background, but in terms of practical usage, that is the net effect, and how the different lenses that present the subject and background can be exploited for creative control. Okay, that's all the testing I have for you. I hope you found this comparison helpful, whether you're considering purchasing your first Mako Cinema lens, or if you're trying to decide what focal lengths to add to your kit. The Makas constitute a broad family of lenses that are truly designed to work together, both physically and optically, not just a bunch of different lenses packaged together. But do you need them all? Even at under 400 each, a complete set approaches three grand. And while it's not hard to spend that much on even a single real cinema lens, $3,000 is a significant amount of money for these lenses' most obvious target audience, indie filmmakers. So what if you can only afford one lens? That's easy, the 25mm. Even with its propensity for chromatic aberration, it is not only the most versatile focal length, it renders the most balanced image. Moving up to the right three lenses gets you to a basic but flexible indie filmmaker kit. The traditional choice would be the 12, 25, and 50 roughly corresponding to 24, 50, and 100 in full-frame equivalency. I would humbly replace replacing the 12 
with the 16. It's slightly better in most objective measures of image quality, can focus insanely close, and I've found the 12mm is often just too wide if I want to keep lighting and crew out of the shot. So let's say now you've got your basic kit, which lenses should you use to round it out? That's a very personal decision based on your style of shooting. Only you know if you prefer to go wider or go close. I can say that the 35mm is my least favorite lens in the line. It flares far too easily for my comfort, and it's just not that different of a field of view compared to the lenses it sits between. The 65 and 85 both make amazing portrait close-up lenses. If you typically shoot smaller locations, consider the 65, and if you often find yourself wanting more reach, go with the 85. So how do the Makas compare to the competition? That's a tricky question to answer because we have to first decide what is their competition. In their price range, there are only a few comparables. The Rokinon DS are larger and heavier, yet have a cheaper plastic build. Some of them open up wider, but they quickly get very soft below 2.8. They rehouse still lenses that don't match each other, with fairly short focus throws, and don't feel very smooth at all. The Rokinons get the job done. I used them for years, but personally I'd never go back. SLR Magic's microprimes are well-made lenses, but their options mostly range between 12 and 25 mm. They largely ignore the telephoto range. Optically, they don't match each other particularly well. Neither their maximum aperture nor their blade design is consistent. Their price also varies from lens to lens, sometimes as much as $150 more than the equivalent Meka. At $1,500 each and covering a range from 10 to 70 millimeters between the two, DZO Film's Micro Four Thirds parafocal cine lenses are, at least on paper, an interesting alternative to make a set of primes. I've never used them, so I can't comment on either their physical or optical qualities, but if DZO Film wants to send me the pair for review, I'd love to see how they stack up. After that, I think you have to jump up to the Zine lenses, which are more than two and a half times the cost of Makas, and offer pretty much the same optical performance as the cheaply rehab Rokinons. And beyond the zines, well, yeah. I think the biggest question someone considering the make of lenses needs to ask themselves is, am I comfortable being locked into the Micro Four Thirds format, or do I want to future-proof my lens investment with full-frame glass? If you're an owner-operator, this is a tricky question. Quality lenses could last your entire career. If you buy the Makas, you should do so knowing how long it will take for them to be profitable, and thus how long before you could practically switch formats without taking a bath. If you instead decide to invest in quality full-frame glass, it will take much longer to pay for, but the potential useful life might also be longer. Only you can do this math. If instead you're like me, an indie filmmaker, someone who wants to tell their own story instead of being paid to tell someone else's, then the decision is much easier. Your camera and lens package is one of the least important aspects of your production. Spend the least you can to get quality tools that allow you to do the job you need to do without fighting with them every step of the way. Every penny you spend on something else, talent, locations, production design, sound, anything, Buying a talented DP an extra hour to light a scene will yield an infinitely better shot than buying a more expensive lens. Speaking of filmmaking, if you found this video useful, you really want to subscribe so that you're notified when part 2 comes out. Yep, part 2. In my next video, you'll be able to compare how each lens performs in a real scene. And not only a real scene, you'll be able to compare the differences in the exact same scene, with the exact same actors, in the exact same locations, under the exact same lighting. I've never seen this done before, and I'm really excited to see for myself exactly how lens choice impacts the feel of a scene. Remember to leave a comment below if you want to win one of these lenses, and consider purchasing my pocket LUTs. They were used for the comparison portion of this video. With over 300 discrete corrections, they provide a great starting point for your own creative grade. Now get out there and crush it. From similarly, similarly, from similarly,